For today's story, we are talking about one of the first lawsuits against critical race theory. Stick around and I'll give you my color of law. Hello everyone and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I hope you will enjoy this legal educational content and today may be the day I earn your subscription. For today's case, we're dealing with Stacy DeMar versus the Board of Education of Skokie, Illinois. In this case, Ms. DeMar is a teacher in the school district, district number 65 to be exact, and she's seen some things that suggest to her the teaching of critical race theory, discrimination on the basis of race. So what exactly is being taught in this school district, district number 65 in Illinois? and how might it trip up with federal law. So we're going to read this lawsuit from Ms. DeMar and we're gonna see what she alleges is going on at the schools in Illinois. Let's get started with this. This action is brought under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act for discrimination on the basis of race. So that is our federal hook, Title VI, discrimination on the basis of race. We are treating someone differently because of their race. Okay, what evidence do we have to support this contention? The superintendent of the schools has recently declared to District 65 teachers, if you're not anti-racist, we can't have you in front of our children. What Superintendent Horton means by anti-racist, however, looks like the following image from a lesson taught to the District 65 elementary school students. So this is something that they are showing to the elementary school students, and I will describe it for those of you who can't see it. It is, it is two images on a brown background. On the left-hand image, we have a red superimposed rectangle that says whiteness is a bad deal, it always was. And then on a white thought bubble on the left-hand side, we see, dude, we can see your pointy tail. On the right-hand side, we see on this brown background, we see, first of all, what looks like uh, on the, in, the, in the far background, we see what looks like a person with a hand sh uh, extended. This person appears to be white. And although we can only see the hand of the person, we also see poking from beneath what looks like cloven hooves and fire. So this is apparently the devil, the white devil to be precise, on top of which is a $20 bill, on top of which is the following item on white background contract binding you to whiteness. You get stolen land, stolen riches, and special favors. Whiteness gets to mess endlessly with the lives of your friends, neighbors, loved ones, and all fellow humans of color, the word color being in all caps. For then with a check mark says your soul sign below, sign below. And then it says land, riches, and favors may be revoked at any time for any reason. And then there's a little offshoot that says, for the purpose of profit dollar sign. So right away, again, this is being shot, shown to the elementary school students. So not some really positive lessons with, uh, the, uh, with the critical race theory, but there's some more stuff there. For years now, race-based programming has overtaken District 65 in the name of racial equity. What seems like a relatively benign cause, awful euphemistically called social justice, diversity and inclusion, critical race theory, and culturally responsive teaching, is actually code speak for a much bigger and more dangerous picture. The practice of conditioning individuals to see each other, skin color first and foremost, then pitting different racial groups against each other. Beginning in 2017, District 65 made it a primary objective for every teacher to undergo anti-racist training within two years. District 65 continues to provide anti-racist training to this day. In this so-called anti-racist training, District 65 requires its teachers to accept that white individuals are loud, authoritative, and controlling, to understand to be less white is to be less racially oppressive, to acknowledge that white identity is inherently racist, to denounce white privilege, to participate in exercises with individuals only of the same color called affinity groups, that is to racially segregate themselves, and to participate in so-called privilege walks, a group exercise whereby teachers standing in line separate from each other in response to the prompt because of my race or color. If a teacher opposes questions or disengages from these teachings, District 65 blatantly calls them racist. 
For example, District 65's curriculum for pre-K through eighth grade students teaches. So this is what we are teaching the students. Whiteness is a bad deal, it always was. Racism is a white person's problem and we're all caught up in it. Students should consider what it means to be white but not be part of whiteness. White people have very, very serious problems and they should start thinking about what to do about it. In the same way that the systems and the government are controlled by white people and racism being a result of it, so it is with men controlling systems and government and messages about women being dumb, weak, and inferior being a result. Wow. It is important to disrupt the Western nuclear family dynamics as the best proper ways to have a family. Racial injustice means an act or occurrence motivated by anti-blackness or racism. White people play a big role in the problems of racism today and throughout the world history. To treat everyone equally is a colorblind message and colorblindness helps racism. Colorblind colorblindness helps racism. Color blindness helps racism. Okay, burying truth is something many white people do to ignore racism. Because of the overt and subliminal messages about capital B black people being bad, ugly, and inferior to capital W white people, capital, w, capital B black people feel pressure to assimilate or throw away their cultures in order to become more like the capital W white people in the hopes of being more accepted by society. Students should sign a pledge to be anti-racist. Students should gather in affinity groups segregated by skin color. Again, this is what they are teaching the students. Students should participate in privilege walks. White students should understand white privilege, internalized dominance, and microaggressions. So, yeah, the, the school district in Illinois, School District 65, uh, has some pretty clear thoughts on some capital W whiteness and capital B blackness, and also uh, some things about women, because apparently uh, the capital W whiteness believes women are dramatically inferior or something. Wow, that's a lot. Let's read more. Throughout its culture and programming, District 65 promotes and reinforces a view of race essentialism that divides America into oppressor and oppressed based solely on skin color. District 65 sets up a dichotomy between white and non-white races that depicts whiteness as inherently racist and a tool of oppression. In furtherance of the ideology, District 65 employs affinity groups which segregate faculty members and students into groups on the basis of race. Even District 65's use of language is designed to promote a view of race essentialism and to treat teachers and students differently because of race. For example, District 65 defines race as a political construction created to concentrate power with white people and legitimize dominance over non-white people. Wow. District 65 defines racism as created for groups historically or currently defined as white being advantaged, and groups historically defined as non-white as being disadvantaged. Group 65 further explains that racism is not mere racial prejudice, which is what I thought racism was all these years. That's exactly what I thought racism was. I thought racism was racial prejudice. I thought it's when you prejudge someone based on race. That's what I thought racism was. But District 65 apparently wants to teach me that's not true. But rather, racism is prejudice and power. So if you don't have power, you can't be racist until you do have power, at which point you're instantly racist, I guess. Finally, District 65 describes whiteness as a key mechanism through which power operates. So yeah, we, 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 we've, dis, we've discarded the idea that racism means prejudging someone based on race. That's what I thought racism was all these years. I thought it's when you looked at someone on the basis of race and you said, you know, I think that person is lesser than me merely because of their skin color. I thought that's what racism was, but no, no, I was wrong. Apparently it's only prejudice with power. How fun and exciting. The school district has apparently uh, adopted something called the Courageous Conversation Program. There are four agreements and six conditions to this Courageous Conversation Programmer Program. Educators in District 65 are expected to comply with all of them. According to the program, the four agreements are to serve as a bridge to discuss race because educators quickly become silent, defiant, angry, or judgmental on the topic, 
The six conditions are topics educators must discuss, including let's talk about capital W whiteness and keeping the spotlight on race. Why are we doing that? Why are we keeping the spotlight on race to fight racism? Seems very counterproductive. Throughout Courageous Conversation, District 65 asserts white people tend to dominate conversations by setting the tone for how everyone must talk and which words should be used. It uses the terms white talk and color commentary to describe how individuals of different races interact. It describes white talk as loud, authoritative, and controlling, and color commentary as silent respect and disconnect. Wow. Uh, so apparently commentary is silence. Uh, okay, that's, that's a lot. In the 2019-2020 school year, District 65 offered, offered sessions called Racial Affinity Groups, Asian and Latina X, Courageous Self-Care, and racial affinity groups, indigenous and black. Both sessions, sessions use the courageous conversation materials and facilitators. The district also conducted professional development training for administrators that use the racially segregated affinity groups, segregating the faculty based on race. District 65 also endorses racial exclusion among staff through these voluntary affinity groups. For example, in 2019, the Black Affinity Group of King Arts read an open letter to their non-Black colleagues at a staff meeting. The group said, we've noticed that we are often directed by some of our white colleagues who handle the difficult students, which are often students of color. And while we handle our classes like champions, we have watched some of our white colleagues get help Help, help handling a situation that we could have help, help handled in 10 minutes alone. Wow, racial animus among the staff. During mandatory Beyond Diversity training, so Beyond Diversity is yet another program here, District 65 in inculcated through the courageous conversation the idea that privilege means the amount of melanin in a person's skin, hair, and eyes. Well, that's one way to define privilege. I mean, that's one way to define privilege. We. We are just skipping all together. We're just skipping all the steps, man. We, we are not trying to show that you actually have any preferred status. We are literally saying that privilege is equal to the amount of melanin in your skin. The more melanin you have, the less privilege, I guess. So privilege equals melanin. It's the metachlorians of our time, man. Wow. Similarly, District 65 sets out definitions of terms. Oh, I'm so I'm so glad. We're gonna learn some new and exciting definitions together, friends. We're gonna learn new and exciting definitions. Are you ready for some new and exciting definitions? Are you ready to relearn words you already thought you knew the definition to? You don't know the definition to it. No problem. District 65 is here to help. Here's your new and revised definitions. Please pay please pay attention. Privilege is unearned social power according to institutions of society to members of a dominant group. For example, white privilege and male privilege. White privilege is the unquestioned and unearned set of advantages, entitlements, benefits, and choices bestowed on people solely because they are white. Structural white privilege is a system of white domination that creates and maintains belief systems that make current racial advantages and disadvantages seem normal. Interpersonal white privilege is behavior between people that consciously or unconsciously reflects white superiority or entitlement. Cultural white privilege is a set of dominant cultural assumptions about what is good, normal, or appropriate that reflects Western European white worldviews and dismisses or, or demonizes other worldviews. Throughout the Courageous Conversation, again, that's a proper name, Courageous Conversation. Throughout the Courageous Conversation, District 65 urges educators to acknowledge white skin privilege in the name of fully examining the implications of whiteness in schools. During mandatory Beyond Diversity trainings, District 65 required educators to participate in a Courageous Conversation exercise entitled White Privilege, the Color Line Exercise. The stated purpose of this exercise was to develop a clear understanding of the ways in which whiteness impacts their daily experiences. Wow. Just, just wow. This is, this is a lot of shit, man. This is what's going on in schools. This is at least what's going on in Skokie, Illinois, and I'm pretty sure it's not limited to that. I'm sure there are different versions of different words in different schools. But, you know, the, this general sentiment 
Yeah, we're getting we're getting a peek behind the cur curtain, man, in this first lawsuit. First lawsuit I'm at least aware of. There might be other lawsuits. It's maybe not the first ever, but first one that crossed my attention. I'm trying to bring this to light and saying, hey, you know what? Maybe this is discrimination on the basis of race in violation of Title VI. You think? Scenarios include, because of my race or color, I can speak in public to powerful male group without putting my race on trial. Because of my race or color, if I should need to move, I'm pretty sure of renting or purchasing housing in an area which I can afford and in which I'd want to live. Because of my race or color, I can be sure my children will be given curricular materials that testify to their existence of their race. You know what? Actually, as to that last one, we have pretty good evidence against it. We have outstanding evidence against that last one. Because of my race or color, I can be sure my children will be given curricular ma ma materials that testify to the existence of their race. Yeah, not so much on the whiteness thing, because the materials are constantly bashing you over the head. So apparently not so much with that last one because of the materials you yourselves are teaching. The materials contradict themselves. What a strange coincidence. District 65 invited teachers to attend a monthly book study on white fragility. Oh joy leading up to a spanking engagement by D'Angelo, the book's author. It informed teachers the study will focus on condition six, examining the presence and role of whiteness to support us all in continuing to build our racist, racial liter literacy toolbox. For example, in the 2018-2019 school year, District 65 offered these affinity groups to students from kindergarten through the eighth grade to provide an intentional space for students of the same race. We are literally providing spaces for some races and not others to the kindergartners. The affinity group was only offered to students who identify as black. During the 2019-2020 school year, at least one elementary school in District 65 offered racial affinity groups twice a meeting, twice a month for students who were black or white. Though the white student affinity group, through that group, District 65 drilled into the white students the concepts of white privilege, internalized dominance, and microaggressions, and taught the white student affinity group how to act as an ally for students of color. Likewise, as recently as the 2020-21 school year, Nicholas Middle School offered affinity groups for black and brown students that identify as she, her, hers. So. Yeah, you know, the the racial essentialism, the the progressives, the progressives have gotten so woke that at this point they and the KKK could come together. I mean, they're teaching the same things. Since at least 2018, the district has also conducted a privilege walk. Oh joy, we get to learn about this thing the privilege walk, which we learned about earlier. Now you get to learn more about it. In this activity, teachers instruct students to stand in a straight line, much like the courageous conversation color line exercise staff endured in their own training. The teacher then lists a list of prompts such as, if you study the history and culture of your ethnic ancestors in elementary and middle school, take one step forward. If your ancestors ever learned that because of your race, skin color, ethnicity, you're ugly, inferior, or a threat to others, take one step back. Well, the white students should definitely be taking that step back, you know? If you've ever been profiled by someone else using stereotypes, take one step back. Wow. During the 2019 and 2020 school years, District 65 held a week of learning, which was called Black Lives Matter at Social Week of Action, BLM Week. Okay. District 65 literally had Black Lives Matter Week. They called it Black Lives Matter Week. Okay, and pointed it, pointed it as a concrete example of how equity works and trainings are being translated into change in the classroom. Dixie, Dixie, District 65 said, all educators are expected to participate by leading or supporting instruction throughout the Black Lives Matter week. The school board and administrators do not support allowing students to opt out of this. Joy, we do not support allowing the students to opt out of this or any units of study that seek to include a more complete account of the role of historically marginalized people in our society. On the BLM Week 2020 webpage, this is the school's webpage. This is the school's webpage. On the BLM Week 2020 webpage, District 65 states in bold letters, your five-year-old is already racially biased. 
The web page states white kids remain strongly biased in favor of whiteness. Wow. Wow. Just wow. You know, I have to give these guys credit. I have to give these guys credit because the conservatives in their dreams of dreams of dreams could not have invented a caricature this insane. Right? We we lack we lack in conservative circles, we lack the power of imagination necessary to develop this kind of caricature. We can't even we we tell you what the conservatives tell you to be what afraid of and we are not even close because what you should be afraid of is far worse than anything the conservatives ever dreamed up. This is some truly reprehensible shit, ma'am. This is some truly reprehensible shit. It's we we shouldn't be teaching, we shouldn't be teaching, we shouldn't be teaching our kids, they say, that racism is when you have prejudice based on race. Rather, we should be treating them, telling them that your five-year-old is already a racist and white kids remain strongly biased in favor of whiteness. The webpage concludes with the following. If you're neutral in situations of injustice, you've chosen the side of the oppressor. Well, there's no reason to be neutral then. Might as well go full out. So, you know, apparently, apparently we've chosen the side of the oppressor somehow. Amazing. I'm not sure how that's a thing, but okay. Okay, we have more specific stuff for you to learn more things about what's going on in this school district. It might be going on in a school district much nearer to you. Don't ask where the phone call is coming from. It's coming from within inside the house. For examples, in 2020 and 2021, all teachers from pre-K, from pre-K, from pre-K, holy shit, we are literally teaching, we are literally teaching this to the four-year-olds, okay? We're literally teaching this to the four-year-olds, which is good because I guess by the time they're five, they're already racist. We learned that from before. Okay, so in 2021, all teachers from pre-K through fifth grade were instructed to read aloud, not my idea, a book about whiteness, Ordinary Terrible Things, by Anastasia Higginbotham. In the introduction to this book, Higginbotham states that she was motivated to write the story after author Toni Morrison stated, white people have a very, very serious problem and they should start thinking about what they can do about it. Not My Idea teaches racism is a white person's problem and we're all caught up in it. Not My Idea teaches even people you love may behave in ways that show they think they are the good ones. Wow. Splitting family against family now, right? Even people you love may act in ways thinking they're one of the good ones, but don't be fooled because they're not, man. Wow. Not My Idea teaches white supremacy has been lying to kids for centuries. Not My Idea. Okay, this is good. Wow. This is just really good for a legal education channel over here. Not My Idea teaches innocence is overrated. Not My Idea teaches whiteness is a bad deal, it always was. Not My Idea includes a depiction of a white man. So the, the, the images we saw earlier, by the way, that I described to you, apparently those images came from this book. Not My Idea includes a depiction of a white man with the devil's tail holding a contract binding you to whiteness. Per the terms of the contract, whiteness gets stolen land, stolen riches, special favor to mess endlessly with the lives of your friends, neighbors, loved ones, and all fellow humans of colors for the purpose of profit and your soul. After reading this book aloud to the, to the four-year-olds, this was read aloud to the four-year-olds, after reading this book aloud, District 65 instructed the pre-K kindergarten, first and second grade teachers, so that's a maximum of about what, six? Uh, no, first grade, second grade, that's about seven. So we're teaching this from ages four to seven. So we're instructing the four to seven year olds, we're asking them, what does it mean to be white but not be a part of whiteness? Before the fifth grade teachers read the book aloud, District 65 instructed them to tell the students, it's important to recognize that capital W white people play a big role in the problems of racism today and throughout world history. If this is one of the first times you're talking about whiteness, capital W there, it might feel uncomfortable and that's okay. I want you to notice how you feel while we read this book today. If you feel awkward or uncomfortable, sit in that discomfort so you can build the muscles you need to talk about racism identity.
District 65 also instructed the fifth grade teachers to repeat out loud to students the Toni Morrison quote, white people have a very, very serious problem they should start thinking what to do about. Then the teachers were instructed to ask students whether they see truth in the quote. So if you feel uncomfortable in any way, please just continue to sit there and sit there in the uncomfortableness as you're being told what a horrible, horrible person you are. How is this not completely destructive? How is this not child abuse? You're, you're literally demolishing a child's ego in like the Freudian sense. You're, you're destroying themselves. District 65 also instructed fifth grade teachers to repeat out loud to students, pretending not to see in color is called color blindness. Color blindness helps raisins, racism. Many white people use color blindness to ignore the problems of racism. So if we try to factor color out, that's racist. If we try to factor color out, that's racist. That's great. District 65 also instructed the fifth grade teachers to ask the students, what does the author mean by whiteness? And apparently the following answers are anticipated. Burying the truth, colorblindness, xenophobia, ignoring history, and other aspects. Throughout its definition for internalized racism, District 65 teaches, there's a system in place that rewards people of color who support white supremacy and power and coerces or punishes those who do not. Resources like time and money are unequally in the hands and under the control of white people. The standard for what's appropriate or normal that people of color accept are white people or Eurocentric standards. And people of color might, for example, believe we are more violent than white people and not consider state-sanctioned political violence or the hidden or privatized violence of white people and the systems they put in place and support. That is a lot of bullshit, man. Holy God. I mean, trying to give a legal analysis to all this, man. I mean, the legal analysis is pretty simple. I mean, we can just go back to the first principles of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act says, you know, discrimination on the basis of race is bad. And I don't know about you, but this feels a lot like discrimination on the basis of race. Could go either way. Could go either way, maybe. Maybe it's in the eye of the holder. Maybe maybe teaching the white people they're inferior and, and they're the source of all evil and, and the rest of it, maybe, maybe that isn't racist. Well, I guess it's not from their own framework because of power or something, but they're the school district and they have the power to implement it, so even that doesn't work. I'm trying to make sense of something that doesn't make sense. I should move on before my brain hurts more. In 2020, as part of a BLM week, Black Villages curriculum, District 65 included in its lesson plan for the third through fifth grade students, it's important to disrupt the Western nuclear family dynamics as the best slash proper way to have a family. Oh, okay. We need to disrupt the idea of a mother, father, and children as the best and proper way to have a family. Okay. In 2021, as part of the Black Villages curriculum, District 65 included a lesson plan for the third graders, so that's eight-year-olds. During our lesson on whiteness, we discuss how white culture shows up in the way we think about family structures. There's a belief that a normal family consists of mom, dad, son, daughter, and pet. We've learned that isn't true. In 2021, as part of the Black Villages curriculum, District 65 set forth a guiding principle in a lesson plan for fourth graders. So that would be uh, that would be the nine-year-olds. That included another way whiteness, white supremacy, shows up in the United States is the idea of the nuclear family. In 2021, as part of the Black Villages curriculum, District 65 set forth a guiding principle in a lesson plan for fourth graders that included, another way white, white supremacy shows up in the United States is the idea of the nuclear family. In the United States and other countries colonized by European countries, families that consist of mom and dad and two to three children, maybe even a dog, are considered the proper or right way to have a family. In 2021, as part of the Black Villages curriculum, District 65 instructed fifth grade teachers to conduct a survey among students to determine whether each student is an individualist or a collectivist. That's great. Let's identify those individualists so they can be retrained. District 65 instructed teachers to explain the idea of Black Villages and the lessons guiding principles have to do with the idea of collectivism because they focus on how important it is for communities, villages, families, generations to work together for the benefit of everyone. Like those messages in African Proverbs. Oh, that's nice. Let's identify all the individualists so they can be retrained and teach the wonders of collectivism. Wonder why we might be doing that, huh? Yeah. 
District 65 also instructed teachers to explain the principles of intergenerational black villages and black families is important to Black Lives Matter movement because racism is a problem that will take a collective village to solve. I'm not sure how that happens when we're constantly focusing on race, but whatever. And in 2020, District 65 taught the third through fifth graders, which is ages uh, eight through 10, that racial injustice means an act or occurrence motivated by anti-blackness or racism. So the plaintiff, by the way, as I mentioned above, is a drama teacher who works at Nicholas Middle School and has done so for 19 years. So that's them. They're, they're the drama teacher and they're, they're the one here to, to lay it all out for you. So that's who they are. Okay, so let's finally get into some legal cause of action. Equal protection. Racial classifications that are motivated by prejudice or stereotype, even when narrowly tailored, violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Intentional discrimination. Discrimination that violates the Equal Protection Clause also violates Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Discrimination violates the Equal Protection Clause committed by an institution that accepts federal funds violates Title VI. Count three, hostile environment. Defendants have subjected the plaintiff to severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive racial harassment through mandatory race-based training, race-conscious student curriculum, segregated staff meetings and affinity groups, privilege walks, and frequent and repeated affirmation by defendants above the district's commitment to making racial distinctions among student and staff. This deliberate indifference of defendants to ongoing racially hostile environment violates Title VI. So that brings us to the end of the discussion of the complaint that was filed by Stacey DeMar in this case. So now let me give you my color of law. Yeah, as will surprise absolutely no one, my color of law on this is a big fat red what? Like what the hell is going on in Illinois and school districts throughout the country? This is uh, in absolutely no way surprising, which is very depressing that this is happening. This racial essentialism garbage is spreading everywhere, as we learn perhaps most notably in Loudoun County, a place where I used to live very near to, because I used to live in Fairfax County, which is right next door. But we're all learning that this thing's being told, and now we have, I don't know if it's the first ever lawsuit, but at least a lawsuit that is trying to bring this to attention by showing how this discrimination is happening in the schools and discrimination is happening against the teachers as well in violation of Title VI. So, there's a long road to go. There's a long road to go. Not for the least of reasons that school districts and communities and localities and states get quite a lot of leverage when it comes to education because education is classically part of state power. It's part of the police power, this power to do stuff. So there are some serious obstacles here. And also, of course, you have the educational aspect of like trying to teach things. So there's a lot of obstacles. So I don't wanna be unduly optimistic about this. This may not see, this may not get to the end of the day. We'll find out, I suppose. But regardless of whether it does or not, I think this is starting a template. And if this isn't successful, perhaps someone will be. Because this kind of thing, I think, has to stop. I think racism is when you discriminate against someone based on race. You prejudge someone based on race. That's what I think. I think it's bad. I think this racial essentialism garbage is garbage. And I think it's as racist as anything that KKK ever dreamed up. So that's what I think. But at least for a moment, that brings us to the end of the discussion of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.